If you struggled with binge eating disorder or BED before bariatric surgery, can it still be an issue now? Are there differences in binging before surgery versus after? How is BED related to binge grazing? And what does that really mean anyway? Well, don't go anywhere. Dietitian Chandra Evans and psychologist Kelly Broadwater join me to answer all of these questions and share helpful insight for your journey. Looking for an easy to swallow multivitamin that also smells good instead of vitamin E? Check out the once a day easy to swallow tablet from ProCare Health with new scent certs. The orange scent inside the bottle makes supplements not only smell better, but taste better too. It's a whole new way to experience your once daily vitamin. Visit ProCareNow.com and use code SUSAN10 to save 10%. Hi, I'm registered dietitian nutritionist, Dr. Susan Mitchell, ex-radio dietitian turned podcaster. You're listening to the Bariatric Surgery Success Podcast, episode number 161. Do you feel frustrated with all the misinformation when it comes to nutrition for bariatric surgery? Eat this food. No, don't eat that food. Try fasting. Try the keto diet. Heck, why don't you just reset your pouch? It's enough to make you give up and say, forget about it. I don't know what to do. Well, I do. I know what to do. It matters where you get your nutrition information. When it comes to your bariatric surgery, nutrition is specific. So let's cut through the nonsense. Let's get you the accurate nutrition information that you want. Simple, actionable, step-by-step strategies that work. I want you to feel well. Get out there every day. Do the things you want to do. And that's why I created Bariatric Surgery Success. This podcast is for you. You're in the right place. And I'm so glad you're listening. And if you love the podcast, would you please write a review on Apple Podcasts? I'd really appreciate it. Do you receive my weekly newsletter, Breaking Down Nutrition? If not, sign up today on the website, Breaking Down Nutrition. Dot com. You'll be the first to know about giveaways and freebies, helpful tips that work, the latest podcasts, and upcoming guest interviews that you don't want to miss, like today with Chandra and Kelly. Are you tired of cravings? Tired of night eating? Want to prevent weight regain? Then be sure and add protein sources you actually eat and that you actually enjoy. Check out my free information for 10 protein tips that work every day. I'll put the link in the show notes and you can find it freebie on the website, breakingdownnutrition.com. Well, joining me today are psychologist and certified eating disorder specialist, Kelly Broadwater, along with registered dietitian, Chandra Evans, who specializes in bariatrics and eating disorders. They have provided bariatric care to pre and post operative patients for the past 20 years. These ladies know what they're talking about. Together, they have co-authored a comprehensive guide entitled Berry Educated, and you can find the link to it in the show notes along with their contact information if you want to reach out. Hello, Kelly. Hello, Chandra. Thanks for joining me on the podcast. Thanks, Susan. Thanks for having us. Well, Kelly, before we jump into questions that are really specific to binge eating disorder, let's start with a solid understanding of what binge eating disorder, also called BED, is all about? Sure. Um, It's actually the most common eating disorder. So sometimes I'm at events and people see, you know, that I treat eating disorders, they go, oh, I don't have one of those. I just eat too much. I'm like, well, that's actually the most common eating disorder, Um, more than anorexia and bulimia combined. So if you're struggling with it, no, you're not alone because there are plenty of people out there. Um, Really, the main thing that we see with binge eating disorder is it's characterized by loss of control. So feeling like you can't eat enough, can't stop eating, um, you're consuming a large amount in a short period of time, um, eating rapidly, eating until you're uncomfortably full or maybe even sick, which is pretty common bariatric folks because their pouch or their sleeve really lets them know. Um, eating when they're not hungry. A lot of times this is happening in secret. You know, they're eating alone because they're embarrassed by the amount they're eating or what they're eating. And then there's a whole host of things that happen afterwards. So they feel disgust, guilt, shame, depression. Um, And then that kind of can 
even start off the cycle of eating even more because they feel bad about what they've done. And then, you and know, it's interesting yeah. what you just said, Kelly. I want to jump in a second. You know, they deal with so much in the bariatric population, which we'll be talking about specifically, but they already deal with so much shame. And here I'm listening to you say that after a binge, they're adding their own shame on top of the shame that they're getting from other people. Yeah. And then I, I call it the shame spiral. Then they just get stuck in that. And you know, it kind of is on a repeat loop and they don't you know, kind of know where to, where to intervene to stop that. So, um, you know, and sure. especially after surgery, cause they're like, why well, had the surgery? Shouldn't this be stopped? And I, I, I think this is an important point to drive home is that bariatric surgery does not cure an eating disorder. Um, you know, if you, thank you. Would you say that one more time loud and clear? <laughs> <laughs> bariatric surgery is not a cure for an eating disorder. So yeah. Be yeah. aware of that if you're dealing or with poor it. eating habits either. So I'm at it. I'll, I'll say that. Speaking of yeah. which, Chandra, how often do you see uh, BED tied to bariatric surgery? Yeah, unfortunately, we witness it quite frequently. Um, as Kelly said, it's the most prevalent eating disorder, but it's also the most commonly recognized in bariatric candidates. So when we see them present for bariatric evaluations, it's the eating disorder that we're most likely to see. Um, for those that are struggling with binge eating disorder preoperatively, we're most likely to notice that it actually starts to reoccur again about two years after surgery when the honeymoon phase is over, kind of the newness of the surgery is gone. They've maybe maximized their weight loss, just kind of starting to get back into old behaviors. And so, um, emotional eating, we do see it reoccur about two years post-surgery. Research actually shows that over 40% of bariatric patients struggle with binge eating disorder. Um, that's a large number to me. Yeah, that's so a large number to me. Yeah. So if any of the listeners are being impacted by this, um, just know that it's really valuable to be proactive in developing a relapse prevention plan with your support team. So we're big advocates for asking for help and getting support and being honest with yourself and talking about what your struggles are and getting help for that. So it's very prevalent. Absolutely. Getting help. I love that. Kelly, I'm thinking about BED. Are there differences? I'm thinking about it, of course, but before and after. So before surgery, are there differences in binging versus postoperatively? Of course, the pouch size is different, but other differences that you might see? I mean, I think the main difference is the volume of food that is consumed. Now, we certainly have seen people that, you know, as they're further out can consume pretty much as much food as they could preoperatively. But I would say the volume of food and the types of food, which I think Chandra will probably get into more. Um, and then I think also, too, I mean, the shame part of it can be worse afterwards yeah. because they're like, well, what am I doing to myself? I went through all of this to not have this happen or to not regain my weight. And, and, you know, why am I still struggling? So I think, you know, that's a, a big. So point. let me ask this question in case somebody's thinking this. So when you're speaking volume of food, so I'm thinking about since the pouch is so much smaller and many times binges, a large amounts of food, but are you seeing more frequent binges with as much food as possible since a smaller pouch, more frequent binges during the day into the evening or just around the clock? It really depends on the person. So we see some people where they kind of are good all day, right? And they, you know, really follow the bariatric mm -hmm. guidelines. And then, you know, there's kind of this reactive mm -hmm. release of like, okay, you know, and they'll engage yeah. in binge eating, you know, more so at nighttime. Um, and then, you know, some people it's more kind of consistent eating a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, you know, kind of throughout the day. So it really just depends on the person, kind of what their pattern is, what their triggers are, kind of what their environmental setup is. You know, a lot of people post COVID work from home. So having access to the kitchen more can be problematic. Yeah, absolutely. So that kind of leads me to the next question, Chandra. So can you elaborate on what the term binge grazing? Because I want to go, oh, wait, binge eating. Clearly, we've been defining that. So a little more specifically, binge grazing. And you probably have heard that term too, and may, you may be doing it. So Chandra, can you elaborate on what binge grazing is exactly? 
Yeah, absolutely. So binging, as Kelly said earlier, is consuming a large amount of food in a short period of time while experiencing a loss of control. And grazing is considered consuming a small amount of food over a long period of time. So because of the smaller stomach and people who've had bariatric surgery, they're unable to consume a large amount of food in one sitting, but cumulatively can consume enough food throughout the day to actually constitute a binge. So it can be hard Mm -hmm. to diagnose when you're trying to identify what is considered a large amount of food. So we also like to consider for a bariatric patient. That can be hard to identify because there's a lot of room for interpretation or opinion on that. Um, So we put this word binge grazing together and we would consider that things that are just uncontrolled eating, loss of control eating, continuous eating, even picking and nibbling. And these behaviors are recognized in 20 to 60% of bariatric patients. Um, Something that's interesting to note is that binge grazing is actually one of the most prominent behaviors that contributes to weight recurrence. So if you recognize yourself doing this, um, early intervention is key, but even if you don't recognize it until later and you might just be hearing it now and trying to um, put two and two together, ask for help in identifying where is this coming from and how to have different coping mechanisms and set your environment up um, Mm -hmm. for more success. Yeah, but binge grazing is the combination of eating a large volume of food, but it's smaller because you're a bariatric patient. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of confusing, but it is this loss of control grazing. And it is often on things um, that are soft calories and liquid calories. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'm thinking from just grazing uh, of the person who grazes. Some people just, that's the way they eat. They graze all day long. They never really mm-hmm. sit down for a meal. They just graze throughout the day. So they might mm-hmm. be thinking, well, I've always been a grazer. So mm-hmm. I don't really know that I understand binge grazing from just grazing. Mm-hmm. Is there one something or a couple of things that truly differentiate it when you're looking at it closely? Yeah, the big difference is feeling a loss of control. So if somebody is grazing, um, their labs are healthy, they feel well physically, they have energy, they have energy to do, you know, some exercise or workouts, and it's and it's not negatively impacting them, and they and it works for them, then then that's okay. But the binging part of it is, I can't stop. I can't stop eating that. I'm craving that foods um, all the time. I can't stop thinking about it. And they don't feel any sense of control about it. That is different than someone who is just a grazer. And I can see why that doesn't happen in the very beginning uh, post-surgery because your hormones uh, hold you back and kind of reduce that appetite for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And then when things start to shift, I can see where that desire, that desire to graze or the certain, oh, maybe slider foods that you might have missed might just start to look just a little bit more appetizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've had patients who um, do tend to graze because they're afraid of feeling too full because the discomfort is much more intense Mm post-surgery. But if they're doing that, while they may or may not be getting all the nutritional needs met, that's not a loss of control. That's just grazing. And that may or may not be working for them. And we could evaluate that together. Um, But the binging part of it is I'm, I'm really out of control and I can't stop this. Kelly, eating what, give us some examples of too. Sorry, I talked to her. Yeah, eating yeah. non-nutritive I hear foods. That, yeah, yeah, that they're they're not you know grazing on apples, right? Yeah. M and M's. They're not reaching yeah. for broccoli, right? right. <laughs> so, Kelly, do you um, see certain triggers? Give us some examples of what those triggers would be that you see that start your clients to binge. Yes, yeah, so many triggers. I, I read an article recently that said we should really call it reactive eating disorder instead of binge eating disorder because you're reacting to something you know, emotionally or environmentally. I mean, I think a huge piece of things that I see in, in treating my patients is you know, co-occurring mental health issues that aren't adequately treated. So they've got depression or anxiety. Mm-hmm. Uh, a major one, and the research supports this, is uh, trauma. So untreated trauma is a huge um, correlated factor with binge eating. Even, you know, some research shows up to 90 to 95% of, of patients. So um, that, you know, is, is a big one. And I think part of that is because binging puts you in kind of this autopilot, numb, dissociative kind of state. So you're not thinking about sure. you know, anything else. I think difficulty managing emotions and using food to comfort or soothe or stuff down. Or, you know, when I have clients do food records, they see like, oh, Anytime I'm angry, anytime I'm lonely, anytime I'm, you know, they start to recognize those emotional patterns of triggers. 
Um, obviously, the I think stress is- eating is huge. Yes, yeah. absolutely. absolutely. I agree with that. Um, yeah. And then the <laughs> environmental factors too. I mean, are you living with people who are kind of sabotaging you and bringing in, you know, I, I, I say, you know, to my clients, well, if you were an alcoholic, you wouldn't have your, your husband bring your favorite bottle of wine and put it right on the kitchen counter. But people bring in their favorite, you know, binge food yeah. and on the kitchen counter. Yeah, so, what is that? Right, right. And so really being able to be assertive and talk to loved ones about that um, yes. is, a, is a big thing. And, you know, like I said, it, it's so individualized. There's so many different triggers. Um, I just was at a conference and I wish I could remember the exact um, a statistic, but even having a history of food scarcity can lead someone to be more prone to binge eating. So if you grew up in a, a you know, a food impoverished environment, you know, just that sense of like, I'm never going to have this again, or what if I can't eat this again? Yeah, I can understand that. Sure. And, and I'm thinking more as we go th- into nutrition, Chandra, are there other triggers that you see specifically from a nutrition viewpoint? Yeah, absolutely. I want to highlight three of them for today's conversation. Um, When a person is already prone to binging behavior, uh, I mentioned earlier those slider foods. So slider foods and highly palatable foods, uh, which tend to be non-nutritious ones, are the foods that tend to be most triggering for people. So I find that bariatric patients very quickly learn that soft textured or crunchy processed snacks, things like chips and crackers and pretzels, and also liquid calories, things like sweet tea and sugary coffee drinks, they can be consumed in large volumes and they easily slide through the pouch virtually pain-free unless somebody has dumping syndrome from that, which I see that sometimes people also misidentify as irritable bowel syndrome. So um, if you're not sensitive to dumping syndrome, then you can recognize eating large volumes, even if it's binge grazing of pretzels, or I've had clients drink a gallon of sweet tea every day, Pre-surgery, that might be considered an unhealthy habit. Post-surgery, that is actually a way to get your sugar fixed in a way that isn't as painful um, or physically as uncomfortable as eating something a little bit more dense. And so if you recognize that you're doing that, one of my suggestions for you is to make sure that you're pairing protein and or a chewable high fiber food with your soft calorie snack. So that might be adding lunch meat or adding sliced cucumber to your crackers, or that might be Mm -hmm. throwing in some mixed nuts in with your little handful of peanuts. That will help it not be such slider foods and that you you physically will be more uncomfortable and maybe your body will give you more of a sign to stop. Right. Send Send out a cue. That's enough now. Yep. 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 Um, So the other foods that people are most likely to binge on are ones that are extremely processed. Processed foods are currently being engineered to be sweeter, fattier, saltier, and more chemically laden than our brains have evolved to handle. Um, Very calorie dense foods can be triggering. There's a strong desire to consume more of them and then indulge more frequently. Mm -hmm. So if you find yourself doing this, my suggestion for you is that you you really stay away from the all or nothing mindset. Um, If you find yourself overindulging in pretzels and crackers and chips, please don't cut out all carbohydrates or all sugar or all processed food is that is not realistic to maintain in the long run. But I do invite you to consider a few specific foods that you might be most likely to experience a loss of control from. So maybe you have a loss of control when there's goldfish crackers in your house, but not when there's wasa crackers in your house. Or I had a client who had a loss of control on milk, chocolate, chocolate chips. Um, She was eating up to a bag of them a day with that binge grazing definition. So we experimented with um, next time you go to the grocery store, let's buy dark chocolate chips. And her feedback was that didn't work because she didn't get her fix. So we just had to re um, focus on what is your goal? Is your goal yeah. to reduce this behavior or to get your fix? So um, please don't go extreme in cutting out entire food groups or even entire categories of food, but just be really specific for yourself. And sometimes people need to leave them out of your home environment temporarily. And sometimes it's long term, but you don't have to decide that in the initial stages. Just set your yourself up to feel safe in your environment. Um, And then my third nutrition related factor in what creates binging is really, you're really depriving or restricting yourself from food. So this can be intentional. If you're trying to restrict food to try to lose more weight, this might be unintentional. Like you just didn't prioritize meal planning. Um, But if you're depriving and restricting yourself from adequate nourishment, you're setting yourself up to be starving and then become really irritable. And that frustration that you feel can be quick to make you want to throw in the towel and kind of say, screw it, who cares? 
desires. Right. Um, so my advice for you, if you're recognizing this, is to be really intentional with three planned meals and one or two snacks a day. And sometimes they can be really simple. It can be a protein shake or, you know, a, a low fat frozen meal. But do prioritize meal planning because eating every three to four hours helps honor the body's needs and prevents impulsivity of food choices that are often accompanied with under eating. So just a final concept on that is I want to note that eating disorders are not about food mm -hmm. any more than alcoholism is not about being thirsty. So while specific foods or drinks for sake of analogy could be more tempting or triggering, recovery is really about coping and healing emotional wounds. Thank you for that. And I would like you to repeat that last sentence one more time, because you've just given uh, both you and Kelly some really great triggers and really good tips. So as you're going through and you hear what they're saying and you get to the end, this part you might want to come back to again because there is so much good information, good nuggets right here from both of them to use and think about over and over. But Chandra, I think the point that you just made about clearing up and working on the mental health issues because binge eating, stress eating, emotional eating, all of that comes back to things that are going on. So say that one more time. Yeah, so while certain foods are triggering for some people, high fat, high sugar, or slider foods, um, at the end of the day, I, for sake of an analogy, alcoholism is not about being so thirsty that you just have another drink. It's about um, emotional wounds that have not been healed, unresolved trauma, a coping mechanism to try to deal with stress that's going on in your life. And so food is the same function as that, as far as I'm turning to this for comfort, for procrastination, for distraction, to make myself feel better, to yeah. have less pain because eating feels good a lot of the time. So um, it's not about the food and that's a hard concept to comprehend because that's where the obsession is. Sure. Um, and there are nutrition things that you can do that help with recovery, but it's helpful to understand that it's not about the food at the end of the day. And this is why this collaboration of having you as a, a psychologist and a dietitian working together is so critical. You know, Kelly, I'm thinking about these mental health issues as well as just the general transition after surgery, uh, even the, perhaps some grief that goes on after surgery. We've talked about differences in binging before and after, but what about differences in mental health issues that are tied to these binges? I think really most of the mental health issues <clears throat> at the core are the same. I have a client that likes to say the surgery changed my stomach. It didn't change my brain. Um, and I think that's you know, pretty yeah. profound. But I do see where after surgery, especially for people with a history of trauma, that they might have more trauma memories come up, more reactions, different reactions. They might be you know, getting different types of attention or kind of a reawakening of libido even that's scary to them. Um, and so yeah. I would say kind of one of the biggest things that I see different wise is kind of just more awareness, um, especially if you aren't using the food to cope as much It's like, oh gosh, what do I do with all these feelings? I don't know what, what to do with them, where to go with them. Yeah. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll have all these things now going on. What do I do with everything? It can be overwhelming. Don't you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. I tell people there's yeah. no other surgery <clears throat> that's going to change your life as much other than maybe gender reassignment, right? Like there's yeah. just no, no way to be able to, you know, tell someone or or even predict how different things are going to be. Yeah, what's later. coming and the transition, the changes. I would agree with that. So if some of our listeners are thinking that maybe they need some support for BED that they hadn't realized, <clears throat> Chandra, what's a good starting place? And so you really want to look for an integrative <laughs> health team that specializes in bariatrics and eating disorders. And um, that can be easier said than done. That's actually one of the reasons why we wrote Bari Educated is we want eating disorder professionals to be more educated on what bariatric needs are and mm -hmm. then vice versa. So we want you to create a team for yourself that addresses medical, emotional, and nutritional goals. Um, there are a couple helpful websites that I would refer to you to look for support in your area. Um, one of them is called edreferral.com. So you can put in your zip code and find eating disorder professionals, both therapists and dietitians in your area. Um, if there isn't anyone in your area, we're now blessed with the option of having 
providing virtual support. So yeah. um, there's certainly some local communities that aren't going to have an eating disorder treatment center. So maybe there's an option to um, look outside of your state or just outside of your direct area. Um, the American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, known as ASMBS, also has a tab where you can find providers in your area or providers that you could use virtually for both therapy and nutrition. And the third website I would refer you to is called Dietitian Central, and they have dietitians specifically on there that will tell you what their area of expertise is. So they'll tell you if they specialize in bariatrics or eating disorders. Hopefully you can find a professional that specializes in both, but right. um, that, that sometimes is hard. Yeah, it is hard. Uh, and these are great resources. You know, I'm a huge proponent of the interdisciplinary approach to treatment. You need psychologists, you need dietitians, and particularly, as you just said, with, with experience in bariatrics and obesity. So obviously, the two of you work so well together, and you can see that you're tracking here on the same thoughts about treatment. Why do you think, Kelly, that this approach works so well of the dietitian psychologist? Sure. I mean, I think, well, first of all, multidisciplinary treatment is the gold standard for the treatment of eating disorders. Yeah. It always has been, always will be. But, you know, it, bariatric eating disorders being no different. I think the collaborative care is just so important because if I'm really processing deep emotional wounds and past traumas, I'm not going to be like, and how, what'd you have for snack today? That's going to be you know, Chandra's realm. And so I think right. it's really important to have that collaborative care, have a team that is communicating with each other. and. It's also important that we just stay in our lanes, right? So I have a scope of practice. Right. I might know a lot about bariatric nutrition. I've worked with Chandra for 20 years, so I certainly <laughs> have some knowledge base, but I don't want to be giving clients nutritional advice. Just And you know, she's very savvy with the psychological piece of things, but she's not going to go into you know trauma processing with her patients. So yeah. I think that's where it's key to have you know a fully rounded um, team with where everyone's kind of communicating. Right. That, uh, and people who are trained and yeah, and trained in their specialty and, and know what they're talking about. So as we wrap up, what haven't you told us that you feel is so important and moving ahead successfully? What comes to mind? Yeah, what I'd like to share with listeners is that we know that it takes a lot of courage to be really honest with a professional team and yourself when you're struggling with binging. Eating disorder dietitians are very aware that a multitude of factors contribute to this feeling of loss of control, and they will be very patient and compassionate in helping you with recovery. So please find a team that you're comfortable talking to and that you have hope that they can actually help you build a healthy relationship with food. I've had a lot of clients that had shared with me that they had tried going to a dietitian or having a treatment team and maybe didn't have a good experience. Yeah. Please try again, as that can be a good gift for yourself. Not everybody's personality sinks, so don't hesitate to try again. Ask Asking for help is a sign of strength. Yeah, and I would Anything add else? It's, it's never too late, right? So I have clients that you know maybe have struggled with this for years. They never told anyone because of the shame and secrecy, or they're so embarrassed because they have had weight recurrence. And like, please, that's when I want you to come to me. You know, there is no judgment here. It's not too late. You can get help. Um, even you know, no matter how far out from surgery you are. Um, and if you don't heal the underlying causes, then the symptoms are going to keep rising to the top, right? So you, we have to you know, right. dig from the roots instead of cut off the top of the weeds um, for a gardening analogy, which is weird coming from me. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. I like yeah. <laughs> well, uh, thank you both so much. I appreciate your time. This information is so helpful and uh, our listeners are just going to love it so much. Thank you both. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Well, you just heard what Kelly and Chandra said. It is never, ever too late, never too late to reach out. So look beyond the shame that you might feel, look beyond the disappointment in yourself. And remember that this transition, your journey to success, you are so worth it. So please take the time, reach out. Get the help that you need. Bariatric Surgery Success with Dietitian Dr. Susan Mitchell is produced and owned by Practicalories, LLC, 
All rights reserved. Remember, the content provided on this podcast is for information purposes only and doesn't create a patient-provider relationship. It's intended to provide reference material and is not designed to provide medical advice. Please consult your health care provider regarding any medical issues you have relating to symptoms, conditions, diseases, diagnosis, treatments, and side effects. Podcast guests express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions, which do not necessarily reflect or agree with the host, Dr. Susan Mitchell, or Practicalories, LLC.